Do you think the eye is the superior instrument to the camera? Uh, yes and no. I think each one has advantages, and uh, <coughs> the, the job of the good photographer is to use the superiority, superiority of the camera to his advantage and avoid the inferiority. And for instance, <coughs> some uh, instances where the camera is superior to the eye is due to the fact that the focal length of the lens of the eye is fixed. In other words, we see everything always in the same scale, no matter what we do. Well, <clears throat> if we use a camera, we can put on lenses with long, short, medium focal length and get any degree of scale or magnification that we want. Andreas Feininger's unshakable belief in the capacity of the camera to enrich people's way of seeing is reflected in his many books on photography. Anatomy of Nature, Experimental Work, and many others have been a source of inspiration to photographers all over the world. Feininger was born in 1906. The son of Lionel Feininger, the famous Bauhaus painter, he grew up in a world of painting and design which influenced much of his thinking. With the rise of Hitler, he left Germany and emigrated first to Sweden and then to America, where he became a photographer for Life magazine. He has spent his life trying to extend the possibilities of the camera. Experiments with close-up photography of the very small objects in nature have preoccupied him over the last few years. He was one of the first to use telephoto lenses, achieving stunning new perspectives and visual patterns. Finding his contribution to experimental photography has earned him a place among the master photographers. Now, I'll start with a shell. This is what is called a fig shell, which is a very lovely thing, but it doesn't lo look like much, and most people would not pay any attention to it. This is the way I photographed it. Here is another thing. This is a fragment of a shell, which absolutely looks like nothing, but it is eroded and uh, the internal structure becomes visible. If I light this thing properly, this is what I get. This is the actual object and the picture of it, believe it or not. Now for this effect, you have to take many photographs no. or? No, I take only one. I look at this very closely, I'm very nearsighted, and when I take off my glasses, I can look this close and see the structure of this thing. And when I walk along the beach and pick up these things, I hold them so the sunlight hits them at an angle, which brings out the relief yeah. and the texture. And I put it in my pocket, take it home, photograph it, and this marvelous thing comes out of it. Now, here we have a shell of the kind that anybody has seen before and bought probably in a, in a gift shop at the, at, the, at the beach somewhere. Looks like nothing, looks like a piece of kitsch. But I photograph it because I'm intrigued with this, and this is what I get. This to me has dignity and has a beautiful form, and it somehow suggests the sea, the ocean, the wind, the air, the sky. It obviously is a composition. It is artificially put together to get a specific effect. That is not nature faking. That is, you may call it art or whatever you want to but it is deliberately done to get the best effect out of the shell, the strongest visual and emotional effect. Here we have one, what I consider one of the most beautiful of all shells. It's called the Venus, uh, Venus comb shell. And uh, this is the way it looks, and this is the way I photograph it. Why do you think that the photograph seems to have a, an aggressive quality? You touch this thing and you feel, you will feel instantly why I think it is aggressive. Just put your hands around it. Oh yes, it. it's very sharp. It bites you. It is needle pointed all over. It is nothing but aggression. 
and it, it disguises it in nature and yes, brings it out yes, in the photography. Yes, but that's a feeling. Also, what intrigues me is that this is what I call a form of the sea. It looks partly like a fish skeleton and partly like the ribs of a boat, of a wooden boat. These parallel curved pieces. And it is so uh, unmistakably of the sea. And again, by making it large, you see so much more than you would see if you have the thing in front of you, particularly if you see it in a museum, in a showcase, behind glass. But if we would hmm? pause and take time yeah. and look at the actual mm -hmm. object, wouldn't we come to a much deeper understanding of this object by looking at the object than going mm -hmm. via the photograph? Yes, that's true. But how many people have the chance of holding this thing in their hands and studying it, actually? Well, if I make a photograph and put it in a book and sell 10,000 copies, you know, it's the that's the difference. Yes. yes. And the camera enriches your life, both visually and uh, emotionally. In the realm of thought, you think more, you wonder what is it, why is it, you feel something, you enjoy, you get respect of nature. Mr. Feininger, did you always want to be a photographer? No, <clears throat> that actually happened quite accidentally, because uh, I was an architect. I started as an architect and worked as an architect for several years, but uh, those were bad times. It was just before World War II, and eventually I couldn't find work as an architect. So I did architectural photography for architects, and that's how I, how I got involved in photography. I was living in Stockholm at that time and started gradually photographing the city and eventually got the idea of making a book. So then I filled in with the pictures that I thought were important that would make uh, uh, the book uh, typical of Stockholm. And there I got into trouble first because the best views were across water. I could never get very close to them. So I had to use tele photo lenses in what year are we talking about? The year was 1934. What distance would you be? You would be away. Oh, I was about, uh, I would say, three miles at least. And uh, these are some more of these ship's pictures that I shot. And that's how I got, and in particular, into telephotography. But uh, at that time, telephoto lenses were not available commercially, or else they were too expensive for me. So I built my own camera. Since we speak of telephotography, I want to show you a few. For instance, this is a picture of the Empire State Building seen across the meadows and across the Hudson River from a distance of about, of about seven miles. And uh, I found that the farther away you go, the more monumental this building looks. If you stand on Fifth Avenue a block away, the buildings next to you are actually obscuring this immense building because you're so close. So in order to get the feeling of it, I went all the way into New Jersey and shot this picture. Well, let's take this one, for instance. You see there are ships here, here and here, and you see they're quite small. Well, the buildings are very large, but if you take the same shot from a ferry passing by with a normal lens, your ships would be this big and the buildings this small. In other words, the perspective would be what I call unnatural, because the relationship between ship and building is not uh, what it is in real life. I would like to show you a few more telephotographs. This, for instance, is a picture of the uh, United States passing 42nd Street in New York. And again, you see tiny people here. I hope you can see that. They give the scale to the, to, the, to the ship, which is immense. Without this kind of scale, I feel you lose part of what's essential. And only the telephoto lens can bring it out because it doesn't distort. Here is a shot which I took on assignment for life of Coney Island on the 4th of July. And they wanted to show these enormous masses of people. And again, I felt only the telephoto lens would enable me to get this feeling, because if you use a regular lens, you have to go too close. And you see a dozen people in the foreground, very large. <clears throat> and whatever is further away is too small to make any sense. And you get the distortion, the 
people close to you are much too big and the, the ones far away are much too small. This gives you the feeling of masses, like ants swarming, which is what the beach of Coney Island is on the 4th of July. But what you were also <coughs> seduced by is the pattern, isn't it? A certain abstract yes. pattern. Oh, I'm very, always very conscious of uh, what you might call composition. A picture has to have structure, it has to have a, a center of interest, and uh, it has to hold together. And it has to make a graphically interesting design, so to speak, that is terribly important to me. You'll you find in all my pictures. This is a shot of one of the cemeteries of New York, shot with a 40-inch lens. And again, you get the pattern of these tombstones. If you use a smaller lens, a shorter lens, with a standard what you might call a standard lens. Again, the, uh, the stones in the foreground would be much too big and the ones in, back, in the back too small. And you get something that it looks like nothing, you know, ordinary, it's a what picture. But when I look at those two photographs together, mm -hmm. I mean, you're obviously not interested in tombstones or the people. What, you're mm -hmm. interested in what the effect. I want to get the effect of this immensity, the immense masses of people and the immense masses of tombstones, the size of the cemetery, you know, the, colossal amount of dead bodies there, the feeling of it, you know. But it also, you're also very interested in a formal problem, you're also, oh, because yes. it's almost like an abstract painting. Yes, very much so. But there light is also very important. Oh, light. The play of terrible. shadows and light on this yes. one. Yes, yes. Is, I mean, you must have waited a long time for yes. getting that relationship between darkness and light on yes. the photo. Yes, you see, I'm enormously conscious of light. Because unless the light is right, I don't shoot. Light is everything, in particular in black and white photography, where you work with light and shadow, and the shadows give you the feeling of depth. But Only it also gives you mood. Mood, very much, indeed. Yes, it does. And uh, I am very conscious of the, the position of the sun. For instance, in New York, I know exactly when to go where, when the light is just right, either whether I whether I want light or shadow or side light, raking side light for uh, texture on buildings, for instance. So I'm very conscious of that. Because you always have mm -hmm. to seem to have the dual problem. It has to mm -hmm. look right, but it also has to feel right. Yes. But you think this is what the eye sees? Actually, it is, because the camera can show you only what the eye sees. It, it does not create different perspective. But you see it at arm's length. You would see the same, this whole the height of this picture in real life, seen at arm's length like this, would be a quarter of an inch only. You see, and so you are not aware of it. But if you look, for instance, through binoculars, then you see it like the telephoto lens sees, and it is real. The eye sees everything in what we call rectilinear perspective. But with the camera, we have two additional perspectives, cylindrical and spherical. The cylindrical perspective we get when we use a panoramic camera with a swing lens. The spherical perspective we get when we use a fisheye lens. And the advantage is that we can encompass an enormous angle of view in one single picture. And this is a shot <coughs> that I'm particularly fond of. This was, as far as I know, the first time that any photographer ever used a 40-inch lens in the city to make close-ups. Because previous to this, they had used a telephoto lens only to get distant objects close, objects that were too far away to be seen clearly with a normal lens. But here, this could have been shot with any lens, even a wide angle. But I deliberately backed up about six or eight blocks and used the 40-inch lens to get this feeling of traffic jam, this feeling of cars stacked up tightly, one on top of the other, to give the feeling of New York traffic. And only the telephoto lens can give you this feeling. One of the most beautiful features of uh, New York are the big bridges. And again, I feel the telephoto lens does a much better job in photographing them than the standard lens because it gives you the feeling of monumentality. Shot with a normal lens or wide angle lens, the thing, the bridge, stretches out endlessly and, and looks like a toy or skinny. Well, here you feel the massiveness of these, pow of these powerful stone towers. This is another mood. This shows the importance of light, the mood of a picture. Actually, <coughs> this is the same bridge. And you asked me before, uh, what is important uh, uh, to me, light and mood. 
and uh, which is the best moment to shoot something. And I say it depends what you want. Now this, I think, is a good example, because I think both pictures are valid and equally good, but very, very different. They show different moods, different aspects of the same subject. This, to me, has the eerie quality of a Joseph Conrad tale, you know, that old-fashioned bridge and old-fashioned freighter here in the fog. This is a shot of the George Washington Bridge, shot with a 40-inch lens, and again you get the proportions right. In other words, the cars are as small, or seem as small as they, they really are in reality in relation to the immense size of the bridge. If you shoot that with a standard lens from close by, you get a completely distorted picture, what I call distorted. Here you have the feeling of the immensity of this bridge. Do you think that photographs like this <coughs> interpret reality rather than yes. representing it? Both. Because by interpreting, they re represent it more strongly than an actual photograph, which in, in, a, in addition only gives you what you already have seen, and you may not even look at it. You say, oh, gosh, I've seen it a hundred times. But when you see this picture, you look up and you, take, you pay attention, and you see for the first time how enormously big that bridge actually is. It never became conscious to you. I think photographs of this kind, uh, they, they widen uh, your sense of reality because you sh they show your reality as it really is, so to speak, and not only the way you see it. <clears throat> uh, let me show you one more picture, which is the opposite. All the ones I showed previously were taken with a telephoto lens. This one's taken with a wide-angle lens for one reason. I wanted to get the strongest feeling of depth uh, and height in a picture, for which I used distortion deliberately. This is the RCA building, shot from the previous Time and Life building, the roof. I am about halfway the height of the, Empire, of the RCA building, looking more or less down. And through this strong, through strong converging lines, I symbolize the feeling of depth. And get a strong feeling of depth. This shows how different lenses have to be used to get different effects, but they have to be used consciously, deliberately. Mm -hmm. The photographer has to know what he's doing. Do you think, as a photographer, you can make something visually interesting, which is perfect? Not always. Dull so, for the so, eye? Sometimes, sometimes it's hopeless. Sometimes nothing can be done. If it's dull period, there's nothing you can do. Only you use certain tricks, but then it isn't real anymore. That is faking. I wouldn't do that. Could you define what is visually interesting? Well, it's virtually impossible. You have to feel it. You see, it has to... Uh, one important aspect maybe is that it is unusual, that it is eye-catching, and that can be because the subject is unusual, or the light is unusual, or the perspective is unusual, something has to be so that it catches your eye. If you think, oh, I've seen that already, it's boring, forget it, I wouldn't shoot it. But it must be, there must be as many ways of seeing as there are photographers. Or exactly, of course, yes. But this is my personal way of seeing, and not everybody may agree with me, I know that. These are two pictures of tribal masks I shot in the British Museum. They fascinated me. I have a whole series on this. And I deliberately left the reflections in the picture. I could probably have avoided them, either by using a polarizing filter or by asking somebody to open the cases for me so the glass was removed. But these streaks of reflection here and here and here, I think that adds enormously to the fantastic of these two masks. It is a matter of seeing. You see, I saw it this way, other people would have seen it differently, maybe. Because, I mean, again, there is an almost obsessional quality with the formal problem of the photograph. Always. Yes, that is very important. And it also makes the picture somehow more eye-catching, because people will see this and immediately ask what is this, or they may come in and say, didn't the photographer know any better to remove the reflections or watch out for them? Because most amateur photographers in particular 
discover these things after the fact. For instance, they flash a picture in the living room, shoot the family there, and see in the picture on their glass the big reflection of the flash, you know, things like that. But I think your photographs uh, put a very high demand on the viewer because it cancels out first emotions. I think it is not an immediately emotional impact. It is it only could after be. Sometimes it is. I suppose so, yes. Uh, that, I think, is unfortunate for the viewer. It is like a, in modern art. Uh, you see paintings that you don't understand at all. The artist doesn't give a damn that he paints what he wants to paint. If you don't understand it, it's your loss. Uh, I feel a little bit like that. I feel very strongly about what I photograph and how I photograph it. If, if people don't understand it, I think it is because they are not aware of it, what I mean, or it, sometimes it's hard to explain. You see, I'm very, I think, Photography is a means of communication, and I use pictures to communicate. And unless I can communicate, I feel they have failed. But I don't go so far to change my approach to the level of uh, every une visually uneducated person, you see. They have to make a little bit of an effort, and I'll be glad to explain what I saw and why I did it, the way I explained to you now these reflections. And then 99% of the people say, ah, you're right, I never thought of that before. Of course you're right. And it widens their, their range of vision. Their it's horizon. very interesting because, I mean, there was a time when photography imitated paintings very much in yes. the 19th century. Yes. And then there was the time when one moved mm. away from it. Yes. And now, when one looks at your photographs mm. again, it's not that you're imitating paintings, mm. but you come much nearer to the modern painting again. It, to the spirit of the modern To the spirit painting. of the modern the painting. The interpretation yeah. rather than... Uh, than the representation. The representation. Yes. That's right. That's Which is actually true. very interesting because one has mm. almost come full circle again. Yes, yes. To me, a photograph that only shows me something that I've seen before, if, especially in reality, but also in picture form, is a boring picture. I've seen it before, why should I look at it again? I demand from any photograph that it gives me something, that it speaks to me, that it tells me something. And I try to give that in all of my pictures, something that I think is a little bit new to the person who looks at it. David Hockney said he paints and takes photographs. Yeah. He said that the, uh, painting is an accumulation of, uh, of moments and time and yes. so on. And the, true. the photograph is the frozen moment. That's true. And do you feel the same? Uh, I know it, and that is one of the disadvantages of photography rega in regard to painting, in comparison to painting. And you have to be much more observant and careful, because the moment is so terribly important, the right moment. In painting, you can change anything, any time, if you are not happy with it. In a photograph, once you push the button, it's done, finished. You can't do a thing about it. Mr. Feining, you seem to be very much preoccupied, almost obsessed with technique. Well, I wouldn't call it obsessed with technique, because I use technique the way a writer uses words or grammar. In other words, I try to express myself as clearly as I can uh, to make a certain statement. And as a writer, I would select certain words from a number of synonyms. So I select my uh, means of expression, the graphic means of expression. And uh, the more I know, the more of these means I have at my hand, the better I can find the one that fits occasion best, the better I can express myself. So a technique for me is strictly means to an end. I'm not interested in technique as such. I use it uh, because I have to. Are you afraid of sentimentality in photographs? Mm, I don't quite know what sentimentality in photograph means. What do you mean? Can you ex Well, there are it? photographs which appeal very much immediately to the sentiment. Mm. This is a very difficult question because I think it applies mostly to pictures of people. You can hardly use it uh, in connection with objects, no. so... But you have photographed people. I have photographed a few people, but uh, rarely ever in the form of portraits. These are pictures of people doing some things, uh, professional people mostly. And uh, I could show you some. I have yes. some in the book here. This is a, what you might call a portrait of a doctor. Actually, it is a symbolic picture, because all it shows 
is the mirror that uh, used to be so typical for doctors, the symbol of the doctor and the silhouette. But I think it's a very strong picture and anybody will instantly say that's a doctor, even though you cannot say which doctor. It is the portrait of a doctor, not that's the right. portrait of Dr. So and so. It, is sim it symbolizes uh, medicine, so to speak. Now, here I have a, uh, a number of these portraits. Here, for instance, are portraits of two photographers. This one here, on this side, is uh, Karl Meidens, who was a very famous life photographer. He's still alive. And this one was one of the lab, life lab technicians who loved to work with a tiny, tiny two bits Japanese mini miniature camera. Still in both photographs, it seems almost that their camera is much more important than the, the human side, it seems to be pushed back. In a way, that's true. But you see, in both cases, the camera is an extension of themselves because that's the way they work. They live, they live through the camera, make their living with the camera, and the camera is an extension of their eyes. So it is part of them, so to speak. As I said, these are not real portraits. Now, this here, this here is probably the most famous photograph ever made that has been used hundreds of times. It's been in all the magazines. Yes. Here, for instance, there are two more portraits of professionals. <clears throat> this one here is uh, the sculptor David uh, Smith, who is dead now, yes. at work with his blowtorch welding. And this is uh, a physicist. Uh, his name is Dr. Megas. This is another photographer. Uh, Timberman, Elizabeth Timberman was her name, and she's editing film. And I happened to see this picture. I was in the same room with her, editing my films on a light box, and we were side by side, and she looked up and asked me a question, and I saw this absolutely beautiful light illuminating this absolutely beautiful young woman. So I said, Timmy, I have to photograph that. I had no camera. Okay, we'll do it again next time. And uh, we staged it then. But it is exactly where I saw it the first time. It is an a spontaneous, a post-spontaneous photograph, so to speak. But it seems to be one of the few photographs where one can feel the a direct relationship between the subject that's and the photographer. quite true, because that's really the way it was. She asked me a question, I looked at her, she looked at me. Now, this is a photograph of a diamond cutter with his fantastic spectacles, and uh, when I put the lights on him, I saw all these reflections that instantly suggested the sparkling of diamonds to me, and so I photographed him this way. But all, the all these of. photographs, I have the feeling, have very little to do with the actual the subject. It's your interpretation right. of the world. It is. They are not portraits. These are representatives of their profession, so to speak. Formerly, if you look at this portrait there mm -hmm. of yeah. the diamond cutter and you yeah. think about the mask in the British Museum, yes. there's a straight link. Oh, as yes. I do think there is a straight link between your almost abstract later photographs mm -hmm. and the very early photographs mm -hmm. on Coney Island. Yes. A straight formal link. Yeah, yes. Uh, I, I know. It's one of my weaknesses, maybe. I see people as almost as objects. You are very fascinated by nature. Yes, I've been all my life. And I have photographed it both for Life magazine and uh, later especially for myself. I would like to show you a few pictures which I have here. This is a skeleton of a gaboon viper. The way it is constructed is just a marvel to me. All these different ribs and vertebrae, everything growing natural by itself according to a pattern that is transmitted from one generation to another in microscopic form. It's all there. It's in the egg cell and the sperm and invisible. All the instructions to construct a snake, to make it grow properly, stop the growth when it has to be stopped, and make it so it works, it functions. And this is only part of it. There is the heart and there are the blood vessels and the, and the nerves and the brain which can think. All of this comes out of virtually nothing invisible, out of an atomic structure. That to me is beyond any marvel. Do you believe that a photograph <coughs> is able to 
make nature more beautiful? Not more beautiful, but it interprets nature so you get more out of it, because it shows you things that you hadn't seen before, not consciously, or things you hadn't thought of before. For instance, that there can be a beautiful pattern in sand. Most people don't realize it. To them, sand means beach, and uh, sunning feels nice on the feet, on bare feet, but that it has structure and pattern that has hardly ever occurred to them. We perceive nature in color, yes. and yet you all choose to photograph in black and white. I can make stronger statements in black and white. I can control my picture much more. Is that a technical problem? In part, yes. Because, uh, you see, contrast to me is a very important element. And uh, if you photograph on color film, contrast is the enemy. Because if the contrast is too high, you literally get overexposure and underexposure in your same transparency. The shadows and dark parts are underexposed, the highlights and light colors are overexposed, and the effect is most unnatural. So in color photography, you always look for a very soft light. Uh, you, don't, you avoid hard shadows and high contrast, otherwise you, it'll look unnatural. It also cheapens always a little bit. Very much. Is this uh, because of advertising? Yes. And not only that, but it is, I think, because you are so used to it. It's only what you see every day. You have seen it before, it doesn't interest you anymore. As a matter of fact, if you look out here, this is very beautiful. But when you see it in the picture, it is this small. It is reduced in size, and the color probably is almost right, but not quite. It looks gaudy. And uh, you have seen it before, and you say, so what? I have it here. Why should I look at this miserable reproduction? You take the most natural object, mm -hmm. and it almost looks artificial once it's been photographed. Yes, but that's the way it is. That is the re revelation of the camera. It shows you more than you saw. That's why it looks artificial, because in a way it looks unnatural, which means it does not look the way you are used to yes, seeing it. it. Although it is actually natural, it course. is like that. Yeah, I never is. fake anything, you yes. see. For instance, I have... This is a good example. This looks certainly most unnatural. <clears throat> this is the skull of a monkey. It's part of a story I shot for life on bones. And uh, as usual, I wanted to emphasize the structure of this skull, the way it is constructed. <clears throat> if you just look at it, you see a round skull cap in the big eye holes with the eye, socket, the eye sockets, which are normally dark in a skull because there's no light. So it doesn't show much. Besides, it looks dull. So I put a small light bulb into the skull and transluminated it. That way, it is almost like an X-ray photograph. I see the structure of the skull. I see these braces here that reinforce the joints of the sutures, where the skull is weakest. I see these circles here, which reinforce the eye sockets, because the circle is the strongest structural form there is. You see, the way nature has constructed the skull is the way a modern engineer would construct it if he had to construct the skull. These things are fascinating to me, to see how nature has done things that we only do now or realize now. And there it is, has been there for millions of years.